Good morning, sir. Uh, Father, good morning. Core Bishop good morning. John Ferris uh, from St. Louis Gonzaga Church. I have to say first, I have um, been to many uh, funerals and masses um, for people who have passed away. What you did for the Hobika family I thought was unbelievable, and I'm sure you do it for everyone, but you spoke from the heart. It was soothing. It made people feel better, and I think that was just awesome. Well, thank you very much. Joe was a, a dear friend. Yeah. I just loved to hear his stories. I would love to go with yeah. Joe to lunch and just hear his stories. So I'll miss him. I know it's it's hard for the family right yeah. now because yeah. he really was the patriarch. But but I do th- I, I do yes. feel that um, there's a there's a reason for when when you speak about someone and why we have a mass and why we go through the pomp and circumstance that we go through for. For yes. everything leading up to and then death. Yes. So there's a reason because it is to made, it's made to feel like um, things are okay. And you need to take your time doing it. That's yeah, the other yeah. thing. You need to, you just can't be mechanical. You really need to not just say words, but we be with yeah. be with people and, yeah. and share with them. And, and if I could, before we get into the, the this other stuff here that is incredible, um, your trip to Jerusalem and what is going on there and meeting the Pope. Yes. But I do find interesting the, um, you know, because I come from the valley, grew up in the country. Um, our church was an old Methodist church um, that was built in the early 1800s. My mm-hmm. parents and a group of community members revived the church, and, and to this day that's where my parents still go to uh, go to church. And it's no longer a Methodist church because of the churches, the small congregations, they get closed down. And but what I find in Utica, cities like Utica, it's so very interesting. You have the Irish Catholic, you have the Lebanese, and you have the Italians, and they all um, came here and they created their own churches. and And Saint Go- uh, K- uh, Saint Louis Gonzaga is would be a Lebanese church, yes, right? Yes, it's basically very very Lebanese. interesting. Basically Lebanese, uh, and they built the churches. The amazing thing was. Well, St. Louis Gonzaga Church is Lebanese and Maronite, okay? Okay. And it's unique. It's Maronite Catholic, which is a a certain kind of Catholic. Mm -hmm. It's unique in the country because it's the oldest church that was built as a Maronite church and still functioning, which means they built a building that lasted 85 years. That's big, and it's it's an amazing building, and ama- it really is a wonderful yeah. community. I am really. And the congregation lasted that long as well. Yes, which is, yes. The uh, congregation last. The congregation <clears throat> was here for about 110 years. Wow, 110 years they've been here, and uh, still a wonderful group of people. Yeah, well, all of this uh, is incredible history in the history of of this area, and I'm, I'm assuming immigrants came to this area, and the first thing that they they obviously get a, a hold, a, a foothold, but then you build your church. They built the church. The first church was down on Albany, and they built the church. The first floor was the church. The second floor was a dormitory for the men who were sleeping there, saving their money so they could send it back wow. overseas bring, to bring their families Bring back. their families home. Wow. Wow. It's an amazing history we have here. It is. This it melting pot. Amazing uh, community, yes. Okay, uh, you've done some traveling. Too much this past three. You do months. a lot of yeah, traveling. I, yeah, I but, was. Um, I, I. I did uh, in September. I was in New Zealand uh, for about ten days, and then I was in October. I went to Rome for about a week, and then last month, November, I was in uh, the Middle East, in Jerusalem, in Israel. Of all times to Jordan. be in Jerusalem, right? Actually, no. Really? No. Actually, it was it. When you're there, it's a very, very much a sense of normalcy. Mm-hmm. They were having their political crises and things like that with their governments. Yeah, yeah. But it was, I never felt unsafe. And from everybody talking to me today, despite the recent things in uh, the news today, yeah. it's still quite safe. It's, yeah. it's, it's more, well, actually, I was in Jerusalem listening to all the shootings that were occurring in the United States. Yeah, well, yeah, think so about that. So it was, it was yeah. an ironic, yeah. an ironic situation. Uh, but now we're planning another trip in uh, April. But I'm trying to reassure people there's nothing to be afraid yeah, of. Yeah. This, this, this statement about Jerusalem, if I could... Get yeah, into yeah, it. I, I, um, I'm interested to know what you think. Yeah, the the situation in the statement was more for domestic politics mm-hmm. 
than international policy. Right. Well, we've always really recognized uh, that as the Jewish capital, uh, well, at least in the last 10 years, I, I believe, but we never really acted upon it. Is that well, correct? Well, in 1995, <clears throat> the United States government voted, uh, the, the, United, the Congress voted yep. to move the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Right. But ever, no, Nobody no, country's did it. Not, no country's ever done it. Yeah. And... And the presidents have always said, we're going to defer it another six mm -hmm. months. Yeah. See, there's a problem. Kick in the can. Jerusalem mm -hmm. was created in 1940. When Israel was created in 1948, Jerusalem, the city, was created as a special, they called it in Latin, a corpus separatum, mm -hmm. which a separate body, a distinct right. body. The UN wanted that to be an international city. Almost modeled after our own Washington, D.C. Washington, exactly. Similar. Yeah. Uh, not under a state. Yeah. But then the Arabs didn't accept this. So there was a fight, and Israel conquered West Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. East Jerusalem was under Jordanian authority. Then in 67, they conquered the entire city. Right. East and West Jerusalem. Eastern Jerusalem is predominantly Palestinian. Western is predominantly Israeli. Now, the interesting thing about this statement was President Trump said, we're going to make we recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. He did not exclude the possibility that Jerusalem could also be right. the capital of Palestine. Right, and that actually that question was asked, mm -hmm. and they did not they didn't exclude that as a no, possibility. No, no, no. Yeah. Which I think is the way it should. Maybe be. that's opening the door to some di diplomacy, and kind of as opposed to, and this is not just one uh, party. This is uh, this has been since uh, the '60s. Oh no, yeah, exactly. This it's is not, continuously it's, it's, kicked it's down not the road. A partisan Bush, thing. Uh, Obama, everybody did the same thing, really. I what until I'm, now. What I'm concerned about now is though that. I, th I was hopeful with this administration that they were taking some good steps. They were building up confidence and trust. They were yeah. meeting everybody and talking to everybody. It wasn't just a bureaucratic mm -hmm. administrative thing. But with this statement, a unilateral independent statement, the United States is going to have to work hard to recover a position of being an independent, right. honest right. broker. Because yeah. they're, they're not going to, to. We just completely sided with. Uh, completely. Yeah. And yeah. without. And, and with the rest of the world saying, don't do this. And the other part is, on the news, NPR the other day had something. Well, you know, when it happened, they said, okay, this is a city that's very, very important to Muslims and Jews. And Christians. What, what about the Christians? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And with Israel and Palestine partitioning it, I'm really afraid of where the Christians will right. come out in the wash. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Um, now, uh, something that I did not know, and we'll get to the, your trip. Um, you, no, the trip, That's this is fine. Yeah. We, but I, uh, I also, first of all, I did not know you were an attorney. I'm a church lawyer also, yeah. yes, yes. Well, Explain that. <laughs> yes. If, yes. Okay. A canon lawyer. The yeah. church has its own. In yeah. fact, the church's law was before secular law. Mm -hmm. Canon law was before secular law. And so, you are a teacher as well. Yes, I teach canon law at, in Washington, D.C. I fly back and forth once a week or once every other week. Okay, this is the part I think none of us ever knew. Wow. That's just yeah. incredible. Yeah, I teach yeah. I teach in the law school there, and uh, my people, the, my parishioners say that I'm not quite God because God is everywhere. Yeah. I'm everywhere except Utica. Yeah. <laughs> you are. You travel. Yeah. I, you do a lot of traveling. I do a lot of traveling. A lot and of traveling. That's got to be incredible, though, a, a, a wonderful experience for you. I mean, you get to do so many different things. Well, for me personally, it's a good balance between keeping academic interest going and also just a great pastoral life yeah uh, uh, I have a wonderful parish with good people so I get support from there as a family and then I can go to work and teach yeah and and explain where the law comes into play well in the uh, in the Catholic Church for example what are the rights of a priest when he's getting assigned uh, what are the laws regarding property or when you're starting a religious community or the rights of a bishop 
you know, it, and the rights of the Pope with in relationship to the bishop. There's a whole body of law yeah. called the Code of Canon Law for the church, and I I teach that to other people that are going to be practicing law in the wow. at Catholic University. That's unbelievable. Yeah. And and I assume right down to something as simple as we're going to consolidate churches. Uh, All that. It's that, not so something. Yeah. Yeah. Not so. If if you want, see, a bishop can't come say, "I'm going to close that church." Right. If the people appeal, and they do appeal, mm-hmm. they appeal to Rome. It's a very complicated process. It's a very yeah. and appointment of bishops. How is a bishop appointed? All those things, and um, I basic, and then marriage cases. If you're going to declare them, if people are divorced and remarried, we all have those stories from the '60s. Yes, At least there. I, my aunt that um, that was not able to remarry had to leave the church. I mean, the, the church oh, yeah. was much more conservative back then in the '60s. Well, much more. And her her husband had passed away, and the world was. Well, if he passed away, she could get remarried. Uh, Whatever the situation something, was, I'm not sure. There, the situation, exactly. But yeah. 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 Well, um, the world was more conservative, right, right? And this pope, especially, is trying to say to people: if you've been married and you're in a marriage that's not recognized by the church, let's talk. Right. Let's talk to see what we can do to um, so keep you, you close you to the church. You got to. You met with the pope. Yes. And talk about, uh, this is an unorthodox um, pope in many ways. Well, he's he's thinking outside the I box. i got to be careful using that word unorthodox, because I use it for everything. Every, but here, it, there is a, the, it has a pure definition here. Well, he, <laughs> he's, 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 he's a leader. Just throw it around like He's it's... a leader. If you, you, I had never met this pope, because I lived in Rome a long time, but he was from Argentina. So we never crossed paths when he, before he was pope. Yeah. And um, I had the opportunity, not because of who I was, but I had some friends. The school I went to was celebrating its 100th anniversary. They said, the Pope, don't tell anybody, but the Pope is coming. Wow. And then they said, uh, would you like to come? So I went to Rome. And when I went there, the whole area of the school was blocked off hundreds of people and I thought oh what a what a kind of a mess I'm getting into yeah yeah and I had the ticket you had to give security things and all this gave him a ticket then I'm getting in line and they said no no you go over here I said okay so I'll wait more well actually I went into this room and stayed for about 15 minutes and then the Pope came in wow and just greeted us all very warmly. He looks very tired. Mm. He looks, I, I just can't imagine the schedule the man keeps. Yeah, yeah it's quite a responsibility. Because, yeah, at 81. It. Yeah. At 81 with one lung. Wow. What? One, one lung. Yeah, he had, he had an operation. He only has one lung. I guess I didn't realize that. Yes, and he, but just the warmth, and he's not afraid. He loves God so much, he's confident. Let's try some new things. Yeah, yeah. God will take care of us. It is important today, right? I mean, to grow with the times that you still have. I mean, it's not it's it's not like you can just change everything based on on years and years of well, and teaching, the teaching is always is on, the same. Yeah, but you have to realize some things can be changed. Right. You know, some people say you change everything. Some people say we well, can't change anything. He's looking and saying, let's prayerfully and prudently look at things. Yeah. How can we do things better? And if you trust God, remember, the Lord told us, don't be afraid. Right. Just don't be afraid. I got to plug something before I All forget, right. okay? okay. Um, I'm giving a talk on the Holy Land tonight. Okay. At St. Louis Gonzaga Church at 6.30. It's just a talk. We're going to have cookies and coffee, nothing mm-hmm. more special than that. There's no fee involved, nothing like that. I just was sending pictures back. I think, Andrew, you saw some of oh, them yeah. on Facebook. And somebody said, well, why don't you talk a little bit about that? And I said, that would be fine. Yeah. So I'm going to give that at 6, 6.30 at the, in the church hall for about 45 minutes. Right. Some questions and that's all but i'd like to invite anybody wants to come that's awesome you're most welcome uh and before we let you go sure because uh, it's always you're in, intriguing to talk to uh and you do so much traveling and uh, but anything special what do you guys do for uh, for the holiday uh what does your church um our the church really it's the same as most catholic churches yeah. as far as we're having our on we're having our um children's pageant 
Mass at 4 o'clock on Sunday afternoon. That's the thing about the schedule this year for yeah, for right. Christmas, Christmas Eve. We're going out. from Saturday, Sunday morning, and then yeah. Sunday evening starts Christmas Eve, and then we go into Monday morning. So Monday evening, I'm telling everybody, Jesus is born and the priest is dead, <laughs> <laughs> because all we've done, all we've done, is just celebrate Mass yeah. for three days. Yeah, <laughs> right. that's funny. Well, listen, uh, it's always a pleasure to Thank have you, you in so here. Thank you so much for and allowing me to come, inviting me to come, and uh, Merry Christmas to you and all the listeners, Merry and Happy Christmas. Hanukkah. Thank, Thank you, you so much.